So my name's Kenton. I go by Kent. I work for Viasat. You probably saw us in the news a couple of years ago. We got hit real hard in Ukraine. Um, there was a talk at DEF CON last year from our uh, CISO, but I'm, I'm talking about something else unrelated today. This is uh, Zero Downtime Credential Rotation Designs and Lessons Learned. So I'm Kent. I graduated Virginia Tech in 2021, so I'm fairly new to the industry. Go easy on me. Um, I, I had a paper about uh, container resource uh, fuzzing that I thought was pretty cool. But I, I'm a security on it, automation engineer at Viasat, and I like to say I get paid to break things before somebody else does. So one of my first big projects was on credential rotation and credential management for one of our, our newer systems. So let me just run you through a few scenarios that you might want to think about. Um, you recently fired a disgruntled employee who had access to your secrets manager, and you suspect they may have copied some things before they left. Maybe a developer laptop with a bunch of plain text credentials on it was infected with malware, and you think the disk may have gotten owned. Your SOC has detected one of your service accounts being used from an unusual IP in a country you don't operate in. Impossible travel, you know, Google was just talking about that. Or maybe you find out that a third party with access to your infrastructure was breached. You don't know what credentials they had access to, because why would you? You trusted them, right? So in all of these scenarios, uh, once you say, oh crap, right, your next move should be, hey, let's rotate some credentials, right? So maybe we go ask our DevOps teams, hey, I need to change all the credentials for your backend system. Let's see what they say. You might get a response like, I can't change that without a system reboot, so I'll schedule that for the next maintenance window. Downtime, possible. That's why this team is doing it in a maintenance window. Maybe you'll hear, uh, I can try to change that, but we might break everything. Is the business okay with that? Those magic words, the business, right? That means downtime is likely. This, this app isn't gonna handle that. And then a uh, third response you might get is, why do we need to do that? You're gonna take my SLAs for this month, leave me alone. Uh, downtime is guaranteed. This app is held together by twigs and chewing gum, right? So here's the unifying sentiment behind all of this. Cred changes are complex. Doing complex things introduces risk of downtime, which means loss of money. And the best way to reduce risk is to not do things, I guess. So we should never rotate anything ever once we created it set. No, there's an obvious answer in here is we should be practicing, right? And why don't we just practice? So here's, here's my big idea. Uh, credentials are going to leak. It's a question of when, not if. Didn't we just have the biggest password dump like in history recently? It's only getting bigger, right? Since credentials will leak, you should be able to change them quickly and painlessly. And since you need to be able to change them at any time, you may as well practice frequently. How frequently is up to you? Monthly, weekly, daily, hourly, uh, whatever you want. But the point is you should be able to do it. And the act of practicing will teach you a lot about your system and show you how to improve resiliency. It will teach you things that you didn't even know could go wrong because you're uh, destroying some fundamental assumptions. Anyone who's familiar with the chaos engineering principle, this falls firmly into that bucket, right? Best thing you can do is hire a monkey to just poke things and see what falls apart. Okay, so I'm gonna run through some terminology now just about credential management. Again, I'm not talking about humans here. This is all like backend systems, service credentials, service users, certificates, right? The stuff that holds your system together. You probably have a secret manager, and if you don't, you should. A secret manager is a place to store secrets. Here's four very common ones. HashiCorp Vault is pretty good. There's a company called Thycotic that's now known as Delineate. It has a product called Squirrel. You might have used that. AWS has one built into AWS if you have big presence there. Even GitHub has one now for you know your CI pipelines, right? These are everywhere. They offer encrypted storage. They offer you some logs to tell you who's been accessing your secrets, what, where, and hopefully some controls to prevent them from getting out where they're not supposed to be, granular access. What are you keeping in your secrets manager? There's two main types of credentials. A symmetric credential is a credential that must be known by two parties to validate. Typically, that's a client talking to a server. This is an example of a password, an API key, in some cases, symmetric key material, although disclaimer, I'm not gonna talk about that because symmetric key material is kind of its own world of you know, management and complexity and how you transfer that across the network. That, that's kind of a special case, but you might be keeping that in your secrets manager. With symmetric credentials, it's just like a string, right? There's no typically no lifetime built in. So a client, if they have one, doesn't know how long it lasts, right? As far as they're concerned, it could last forever. It could change five minutes from now. Uh, the other type of credential is what we call a derived credential, which are typically short-lived, short-lived in quotes. I mean, you could make something last a year if you want, right? Um, 
but they, these are derived from a symmetric credential. So this is like uh, RFC 7519 JSON web tokens, OAuth bearer tokens, X509 certificates, right? Um, clients are aware of the credential lifetime. Typically you don't store these in a secret manager, but you're gonna store a symmetric thing in your secret manager that is used to derive one of these, right? You could pass these around a secret manager, probably a bad idea because they have times, right? They expire. The important thing about these is that a client that has one of these knows how long it lasts, if it cares, right? You can crack open a JWT and check the expiration time, same with an OAuth token, or read your certificate, right? It's it's in plain text. Uh, that is not the right slide. I skipped to the end. So we're gonna go back up to where we're supposed to be. Uh, here. All right, uh, the last thing that you need if you're managing credentials is you need a secret rotator of some kind. Uh, this is whatever you use to rotate your secrets. Most likely it's a collection of scripts or API libraries or something, right, that changes the credentials and puts the new one in the secret manager when it's done. Some secret managers have APIs that let you do this, like some of the vault backends will let you call an API and rotate the credential for you and push the result into LDAP or something, right? Um, managed cloud services sometimes just do this for you transparently and it all just works, like AWS ACM certificates that you can put on a load balancer, they rotate them for you and you never notice, right? Um, the design of a rotator varies depending on what kind of secrets you have and isn't covered here. I think there's a talk tomorrow where we might talk about some stuff like this, but uh, the important thing is that you have one and it works, right? Okay, so now that you have all of this stuff, here are three algorithms for zero downtime credential rotation. If you take nothing else away, these are very simple things that you can put into your apps to make this stuff work. Uh, before we actually talk about the algorithms, I want to talk about kind of the big picture of how these work. So you either have, uh, for credentials, a push model or a pull model, right? So in a push model, when you deploy your app, your deploy pipeline, whatever it is, is gonna read secrets from your secret manager and hold them in memory, right? It's, these secrets are gonna get injected into your environment somehow. They either go into environment variables, configuration files, or some you know, uh, ephemeral storage in Kubernetes or something, technically that's memory, right? Um, it, they go somewhere where your app can read them, right? And they're pretty much static, right? So they're injected into the environment and they don't change from there on after. The app reads them once on startup, and if you want to change them, you got to reboot the whole thing. Contrast this with a pull model where the app environment is provisioned with a mechanism for interacting with the secret manager directly. So your, your app either has a library that it can use to talk to the secret manager on startup, or maybe it's like a proxy server in your Kubernetes deployment that has a mechanism for reaching back to your vault or something. Um, the point here is that your, your app rereads the secrets as necessary during operation. Instead of giving it the credentials to start, you tell it where it can read the credentials and it knows how to read them whenever it needs to. So again, big picture, in a push model, if you wanna change creds, you gotta redeploy the thing. In a pull model, your app can recover from cred changes automatically, although there are caveats, there's a lot of corner cases you can get into. Okay, so here's strategy number one. Most people are probably familiar with some form of this. This is what we call a blue-green deployment. So. Over on the left is the secret manager where we have two credentials, which I'm calling blue one and green one. These are, for all purposes, identical. They're separate sets of credentials, but they're valid for the same thing. They act the same way. Uh, we're gonna rotate them in different times, but that's the only thing that's different. On the right, I have some replicas of an application. It's not really important what these are, but we have this blue one credential is used in three separate places for this app that's running behind a load balancer, right? So when I decide that I wanna rotate blue, which is in use, right? I start by pushing out green. And I can do this bit by bit, right? So since they're both valid, I push out green to the first replica and make sure nothing breaks. That means that green works, right? And I, I haven't made some fatal assumption I'm gonna break my whole app. If it didn't work, I've still got two replicas, right? I take my one replica offline, figure out what I did wrong and, and nothing bad happens, right? So we've already kind of built in a rollback scenario. Uh, I push out green again. I don't have to do this immediately. I could wait, but why wait, right? I'm gonna push it out. I push it out a third time. Blue one is now gone, right? Nobody is using that because all three of my replicas are updated. So now uh, I can change one to blue two, right? Nobody's using it. Pros, it's easy to do. It's all segregated. You can do it in pieces, right? You have built-in rollback mechanism. The one thing that's kind of a con here is that it's hard to define when you're done if you don't know how many replicas you have. Or let's say you know one of my replicas was unreachable because the network was down or I was having a problem somewhere. I can't rotate blue if I only got two out of three unless I'm gonna kill that replica and everything's okay, right? It puts you into a funny state where can I finish now? Can I not finish now, right? Um, that credential is being abused like right now. I need to get rid of it, but I'm gonna take down part of my, my system, right? So. 
it can also be slow, right? If, if you can't do them all at once, you might be there for a while. So that's strategy number one. Strategy number two is uh, fail and retry. So I have a slightly different picture here. On the left, I have a secret manager where I still have Blue One. I've got my three Apple replicas that are all using Blue One, and I have some backend service that also has Blue One. So this is like an LDAP database or something, right? It doesn't really matter. Um, so in this scenario, I change Blue One to Blue Two, and I do it in both places, right? My backend is updated, and my secret manager is updated. Those are synchronized. Now, the thing that's out of sync right now is the apps. So the apps. One of them is going to try to use blue one and fail, right? I've gone to blue two. Blue one is no longer valid. So what's the app going to do? OK, well, it failed. It's going to go back to the secret manager, retrieve blue two, now try to use blue two, find out it works. The pro here is that uh, I didn't need to do anything to my apps, right? They all knew how to read the secrets. They know how to interpret a failure case. They know that the credential rolled over, right? They just have to go get it and try again. Uh, they can all also do this asynchronously. If they don't talk to this backend very often, I don't need to force synchronize all three replicas. They'll recover when they get around to it, right? And they have to recover in order to keep doing service. Um, now, astute viewer may note that I said zero downtime, and technically, there's a failed network connection in here. Do we really count that as downtime? Well, I mean, the network could go down for unrelated reasons, or it could be buffering, or you could have a, a packet drop or something, right? So I don't really consider this downtime. It's a adverse network condition, almost, in that I needed to refresh my credentials. My, my argument underlying this is that this should be a normal operation that you can recover from, just the same as if your network blipped, or you had a route switch, right, or you lost your connectivity for a moment. You just come back up, right? So in that case, it's not really downtime. Um, uh, another caveat here is that, I mean, your application code has to be more complex because you have to tell it how to read from the secret manager. It can't just read a file and be done. And if you're using commercial off-the-shelf code, talk about that later, but support varies, and it's not always pretty. So anyway, this is strategy two. Strategy three, uh, probably should mention this. So strategy one and two are really only for symmetric credentials. That's mostly where you would use those. The strategy three is hands down the only thing you should be ever doing for a derived credential where you know how long it lasts. So same setup. I've got my secret manager with blue one. I've got my app replicas with blue one. My backend this time doesn't have blue one in it because we're using a derived credential. So each one of my apps is going to derive blue one prime. I know the naming convention sucks, but it, you get the point across. So when I present blue one prime to the backend, it's accepted. And I can do this for as long as I want. Blue one prime has an expiration time in it because it's derived, right? So we're going to wait 75% of the lifetime. That's probably about fair. So for 12 hours, that'd be nine hours. For an hour, that'd be 45 minutes, whatever. So we set a timer and we wake up, right? Uh, with 25% left, at this point, I've already switched over to blue two, right? And I've, I've done this asynchronously. So my secret manager is updated. Uh, the app, when it's time to refresh, is going to go to the secret manager first before it does anything else and go repull this cred. So now it's going to pick up blue two. I can now derive blue two prime while I still have blue one prime, and blue one prime is still valid. I've still got 25% of its life left. So I can try, well, blue one still works, right? I haven't done anything to that. I can now try blue two prime and find out that also works. Great. I just reset my lifetime with a totally new credential. Now I can throw away blue one. Done. Right? I've replaced it, and I can throw away the derived credential. There's really no reason to not do this. right? I mean, there should never be a problem. If you had some problem where your secret manager had a problem and you couldn't generate blue 2 prime, you've got whatever 25% of your lifetime is to figure it out. And if you don't figure it out in that time, you have other problems to worry about, because something's really out of, out of whack. So, All right, there's three pretty basic algorithms, at least we think so. Here's the, the rough stuff. Uh, we took at Viasat one of our next generation ground systems, and we had a requirement that we needed to do this frequently. We wanted to rotate credentials very frequently, basically whenever we wanted, maximum of 90 days, you know, whatever you want to set the, the time limit on. And implementing all of this stuff into a variety of apps with various support for it taught us a lot. So here's the fun part where you can see all the ways that we shot ourselves in the foot. All right, problem number one. I have these structured as problem and then the lesson that we learned. Problem number one is what we called ubiquitous credentials. How many of your service credentials are shared between totally different things? For example, consider you have like a read service account. Client one uses it to read from some database. And because it was convenient at the time when we wrote it and it was a Friday and I didn't feel like making another service account, we also stuck it on client two that uses it to query information from a totally separate API. Alternatively, uh, let's say I slapped an identity certificate on a box and I have two web servers running there that are doing totally different things. It was just convenient to put them on the same box for reasons, right? They're using the same identity cert. 
if both clients or both apps or process, whatever, use the same credential, they become inexorably linked, right? They are stuck together forever. And you might not think about that when you did it, but it's going to pro probably cause a problem later when you rotate the credential. They rotate. And if they have downtime because something goes terribly wrong, that's going to happen together. So your blast radius is increased. And if one client gets compromised, both systems are at risk, right? If I lose service account A from client A and it's also used by client B, my attacker might figure that out and now they've got two for the price of one, right? This flies in the face of a lot of the um, you know, least privileged principle that we espouse a lot, but it's convenient to do it sometimes, right? I think we've all done stuff like this. So lesson number one, granularity is important. Uh, service credentials should always be split along logical boundaries, whatever that is for you. So applications, probably a good idea. Deployment environment, you should have separate for dev, test, pre-prod, prod, however many environments you have. Your back-end system, if they're different, you should have separate credentials. Your RBAC level, if somebody only needs read and all you have right now is read, write, or crud, make a new one, right? It's, it's not worth sharing. Um, anytime you need to uh, make a new credential for a system, you should ask, what is the current blast radius of the credential I already have? And how would sharing it increase risk if it gets compromised, right? I, again, this is very basic. It's the principle of least privilege. But as developers, sometimes we get lazy. We cut corners, right? And you'll find this out once you start rotating credentials and stuff breaks in totally random places that you had no idea about. And you know, you get a call from somebody, why did my app break in pre-prod when I rotated a prod credential for a totally different system, right? Here's a, a picture that I like of a gate that has six locks on it. Uh, but you only need one key to open it. Yeah, I lifted this off of Reddit. This is like a ranch thing that people do when they have lots of people with different keys with different access to stuff, but they all need access to one place. All you need is one key to open this, but if somebody loses their key, you only have to replace one lock. You don't have to replace all five, or six, rather. OK, problem number two. This one's a little bit more fun. Do you know what your client software does if it doesn't have valid credentials? Well, I can tell you what ours did. Uh, scenario one, retry with no delay. So the client got stuck in a CPU or network bound retry loop, bashing against the API it was trying to talk to with the bad credential. It didn't even check the case that the credential might be wrong, wasn't even considered. This overwhelmed the target API, or actually we, we overwhelmed the secret manager at one point in a self-inflicted DOS attack, right? We, we DOSed ourselves. Uh, problem number two, so we've, we fixed the DOS problem maybe, but um, so we implemented some back off. You can end up with this thing called a thundering herd. So if you have 30 replicas and all of them need to do a refresh cycle at once, right? Um, maybe they all wait for one second and then they try again. And then they wait for two seconds and they try again. And then three seconds, right? You're just creating a little wave effect, right? Where you just pound, instead of a, a fully, uh, you know, uh, max efficiency DOS attack, you're just DOSing very slowly over time, right? This is a well-documented thundering herd problem. So uh, yeah, jitter is important when you do time calculations. You always need to add a little randomness to, to fudge the time so that you don't do this. Um, here's another, uh, this one's kind of fun. This one's a little bit more insidious. So this was a, what we called leaky threads. So we had some designs that, um, especially in like uh, Go or, or a, a language that uses like a user space threading model, you just spin off a thread for your connection, right? And uh, assume that it will raise an error of some kind when you have a credential problem, right? If you don't actually terminate that thread once it raises the error, you're just going to leak threads over time. So whenever we would do a credential rollover, we'd have like 20 threads running on connections, right? We would leave all 20 of those still running and then bring in another 20 with the new credential, right? And if we rolled it again, now we would go to 60 or whatever that was, right? So over time, these threads would pile up and they just filled up the network, <laughs> right? Just uh, boxes got, you know. Uh, we were wondering, where is all this traffic coming from? I'm only running three apps. It's because one app had like 500 threads in it, right? That weren't doing anything, but just spamming credential errors over and over again. So if this sounds like you might have this problem and you've never tried it, you might want to find out because uh, this is bad, right? Um, so lesson number two is that uh, WAFs, web application firewalls, are always worth it. You should never assume that your internal clients will behave themselves. Um, if the service that you're talking to is critical, it needs a WAF. Because if an internal client on a fiber link can knock you over, like if you can generate a gigabyte worth of traffic, like or gigabit per second, like that, that's insane. You're created a liability for yourself. Because if I'm an attacker and I get inside your network, I don't even need to poke anything, right? If I can just generate an internal DOS attack, you're dead. Uh, it might be showing my age, but this is a, a clip from SpongeBob that I like, where uh, 
if I were to die right now in the, some sort of fire explosion due to the carelessness of a friend, well, that would just be okay. Don't, don't say that, right? Build a WAF. Okay, here's, here's another fun one. Problem three, lockout events. We've talked a lot about like human credentials today, and typically if you have a human credential and you just spam passwords against an API, you're gonna get locked out, right? The parameters may differ about like how long you get locked out or for what time, right? Or you know, you could do a refresh to change it. But um, if you have service accounts that look a lot like human users, do you know if their password policy is different than your human users? Because for a while, ours wasn't. Um, if that po if that password policy is the same, all it takes is one client with a bad password to lock the account out, and then nobody can use it. And if it's shared in multiple places among like replicas of an app, you've just taken all of your replicas offline and all you needed was one bad client. You, in fact, you don't even need the password, right? You just need the username. If your API supports lockout by just having a username, then anybody can do that if they just have it. The, the username becomes secret, right? So that that's kind of insane. Um, a, a human can do this, right? If I can grab one of your usernames. Oh, if you have a public API that's ex you know exposed to the public internet that service accounts can auth to, I don't even need to be inside your network. If I can learn the name of one of your service accounts, I can just spam your API and lock it out whenever I feel like it, right? Ask us how we found that out. Um, I mean, this is an easy problem to fix, right? You just change your password policy for service accounts, but the same general problem ap applies to WAFs and client IPs that are behind a NAT. So let's say that you have a bunch of apps running on a node and one of them is just spamming an API because it's broken or it's an old deployment or something that you forgot about in a test environment. If that creates enough traffic to trigger a WAF IP block to a service that you're using for legitimate clients, that whole node is dead, right? Because the WAF just blocked the node IP. Uh, this is particularly insidious on Kubernetes when you have apps that move around between nodes. So if you have one that's just moving around from node to node and just spamming and locking out the whole node, ask us how we found that one. <laughs> okay, uh, so the lesson to learn here is that one bad apple can spoil your bushel Literally, uh, service account lockout policies can easily be replaced by monitoring and high complexity requirements. Um, yeah, if you treat your service accounts like you treat humans, you're probably doing something wrong. You probably shouldn't be using service accounts in general, but if you're stuck with them, you, you're doing something wrong. The, the NAT blocking problem is a lot harder to fix because, I mean, in a lot of places, we don't have anything better than a client IP. So kind of ask yourself, how can you figure out like what's doing it, right? Um, if you get an alert from your WAF that an IP internal to your network has gotten blocked, how quickly can you figure out what it is on that node that's causing that problem? Because it's not as easy as just going to PS, right, and looking at a process listing, right? Uh, we've tried that. If you're on Kubernetes, you know, you got to find a pod, you got to reverse your way through a NAT to the pod, and then figure out the pod IP, and then start looking at pod logs. It, like, it takes forever. So get good at doing this, if this sounds like it might be relevant to you. All right, problem number four. We talked about secret managers. Do you know what happens if your secret manager has bad data in it? Either because your rotation pipeline broke down or a user decided to put in, haha, funny, I'm quitting, right, into place of your service password or something, right? Um, or, I mean, here's a, a, a worst case scenario. Let's say that your rotator is running, it's updated a password, it's waiting to write it into the secret manager and the network goes down at the critical moment, right? Where we have the new password, but we can't give it to anybody because we literally can't talk to anybody. Um, I mean, th this is an avenue for attack, right? A lot of the time we think about secret managers being compromised or like read out or dumped, but I don't need to dump it if I can just like wipe it or fill it with garbage, right? I, eventually I'll crash your system either way. Um, how reliable is your rotator program, right? Uh, if you're waiting for a reverse alert from like a customer or like a, a developer team to say, hey, something isn't working, then you're gonna have downtime, right? So uh, the, the lesson to be learned here is that for everything credential related, whenever you're gonna rotate anything, you need to have layers of logs and alerts, right? So reverse alerts here are like the final layer of protection for credential related issue. If you waited that long, you've already failed, right? Um, you should be getting forward alerts or events from your rotator. If it knows that it failed, it should let you know. Maybe it should even X matters you because that could be really bad. Um, your application, if your application is not logging, hey, I tried to use this credential and it didn't work, help before it retries, right? That's a problem. This should never happen silently. Um, you also probably want some big picture alerts to kind of monitor, hey, what is this credential doing in my system, right? We often think about this for people to see where they're authenticating from and what they're doing, but you should be doing the same thing for your backend system too. Um, after you rotate a password, 
I mean, you're probably going to see failures, right, of some kind as the apps kind of figure out, hey, this thing rotated, right? I need to refresh the new one. Do you know how many you're expecting to see, right? How long do you see them, right? I mean, what's your stagger window of uh, if it's more than 12 hours afterward, everything should have recovered. So anything I see beyond that is probably weird, right, or, or something that's not recovering. Uh, how can you detect if a system is not recovering, right? Can, can you detect that without even looking at the app logs just from seeing, hey, this credential just keeps failing from this IP long after it should have? Can I raise the alarm to the DevOps team to go take a look or something, right? Because my, you know, the security log indicates there's a problem here. Uh, this is a picture of like modern tank armor, right? You know, you have your titanium alloy and then a bunch of ceramic and then some more titanium alloy. They, like you should think about your logs for credential related stuff like this. If you only have one layer, you're, the first bullet that hits you is like you're dead. Okay, uh, problem five is anybody these days is probably using a lot of commercial off the shelf software. And a lot of these for various reasons don't include look, hooks for what we'd call touchless credential refresh, right? A lot of COTS software is designed around, you deploy it and the cred never changes. Some of them, especially more modern stuff I've seen, kind of thinks, especially for like certificates, is like, hey, we put a watcher on the disk to see if your certificate has changed, we'll reread it in, we'll do that every five minutes, and so just drop it off in the disk course and we'll be fine, right? Um, something like Apache, where like you have to do a soft reload to get it to reload the cert. I, Apache's fine, it's a wonderful product, but it didn't they didn't think to include this, right? You have to reboot it. Um, these kind of assumptions are built into a lot of COT stuff, and it can make it challenging to use when you're really trying to be robust about credential automation because you have to start bolting on additional steps. It's like, okay, after I rotate this credential and I push it into the secret manager, I have to log onto this node and do this thing, or I have to write an API to let me remotely reboot all of my proxies, right? Because they don't understand that the credential has been changed or something. And that, in general, I think that's just a a relic of kind of assumptions we made a long time ago that credentials don't change very often, right? Or, or there's no need to keep up with this kind of thing. But um, dealing with this in COTS is instant technical debt, right? If you have to be writing this like bolt-on code to, hey, I've updated my password, please reload it, right? Like it's, it's just silly, right? At best, it's flimsy. At worst, it's technical debt. Um, even some stuff that does uh, let you change password, they don't let you tune anything that would be good to tune. Like how long do you want to back off for? What back off strategy do you want to use? What jitter calculations do you want to use, right? To prevent these thundering herd problems. It's just not exposed. So lesson five, this is a plea that we made to all of our developers and a plea that I'm kind of making to all of you is if you write software for security purposes that interacts with credentials, let this stuff be tunable, right? Assume I'm gonna wanna change every credential at runtime unless there's some critical reason why I can't and I must reboot. If I have the option to change it for like networking or whatever, just let me do that, right? Make it easy. Give me a callback mechanism in your client library that I can use to refresh. Add a file watch functionality you can reread from the disk. Give me options to control back off jitter and retry. Do not hide credential related logs in debug. They belong in warning, error, or critical. The number of times that we've had to turn on a debug log to see that a credential was failing is ridiculous. Because debug logs I can't run in production. They produce like terabytes of data, right? These don't belong there. And never swallow errors. There's some applications that will like fail like hundreds of times before they even log an error or let you know, right? Like you must like let me know, right? If if this is me trying to use your client application, you've done something wrong, right? You're you're failing me. Okay, um, so I have some final thoughts here. Uh, I'm a little bit ahead of schedule, so we'll have time for some Q&A, I think. Um, credentials are only useful if you can change them. Rotation algorithms are pretty basic to implement. At least I hope I made them seem basic, but they're really hard to get right because there's a lot of corner cases and conditions that you need to worry about. You Suddenly you need to worry about what if the network is down? How long am I retrying, right? Under what conditions do I retry, right? Uh, Practice makes perfect, and it requires a collaboration between developers, security, and operations. Hey, if you look at the highlighted letters, there's a buzzword in there, DevSecOps, right? Doing this can turn a DevOps team into a DevSecOps team, right? You make them care about their credentials, and if they don't care, break stuff, right? Break their test deployments and make them care. <laughs> um, and, and finally, right, once you gain confidence and you can start doing these rotations with zero downtime and everything just works, don't stop, right? A lot of the time we look at requirements that say, you know, oh, I need to rotate these 90 days or once a year. Why? If I can do it once a week, why not do it once a week, right? Or, you know, if, if your developers only want to let you do it in a maintenance window, fight that, right? I want to be able to do it during business hours so you don't have to call me if something goes wrong, right? I'm already at my desk. All right, time for questions. So, 
So hey, thanks for your time. And then, um, you know, back I, you know, I used to work in a database monitoring uh, mm-hmm. role a lot, uh, a long time ago. And one of the questions that kept coming uh, up again and again is, hey, IBM Guardian flags this event as a credential failure event. But I'm looking at my application. My application doesn't think uh, about my, my my application doesn't flag this event as a credential fail or a password, uh, you know, mm-hmm. error. So how do you reconcile, uh, you know, your common definition of what is a bad credential event? Because I know it's up to the, uh, you know, individual monitoring tools to then flag that behavior as such. But then how do you come up with a common standard of classifying a bad credential event? So this is actually a really good question. When, because we built detections for this stuff, right? To try to rec- uh, to understand when a client is recovering and when it's not. The best I can tell you is it took a lot of practice because the numbers change depending on how many replicas of an app happen to be deployed when we do the rotation, right? If we're doing like a weekly rotation and the developer team from last week doubled the amount of apps that they're running, maybe that's 4x the number of credentials, right? That are, that are floating around like two per thread or something like that. Um, I, I, don't, I wish I had a magic answer that was like, here's a heuristic you can use, but literally we did it a bunch, saw what the numbers looked like, saw what was normal, right? And then figured out, okay, here's the line in the sand, let's build a detection around that. So we said, anything that's significantly higher than this, basically we have, we have two types of alerts. We have a threshold alert that if we see way too many failures in a very short time period, that means that a client is broken and is in DOS mode, and we need to go like get that now. And then we've got a separate failure that we check for what we call persistent misconfigurations, which is like something didn't update, but it's not causing enough trouble to like disrupt the network. So we have a different alert that looks back over like the last two days and was like, did anything fail at least once an hour for like six hour buckets, right? Like we we built a thing to kind of do queries like that and. It, it turns up like broken deployments and like pre-prod and stuff as different from like a, a failure event. And if the threshold alarm triggers and then triggers again, uh, like we know that is a cue to like go look into it. I, I hope that answered your question. Yeah. Great talk, man. Don't even know where to start. Really enjoyed it. Uh, curious to see if you actually had to deal with incentivization uh, to get, I guess, the depth sock SecOps reality to really happen in terms of did money, if we cut the BS, have to become part of the conversation for the DevOps side of the house to be properly incentivized to take the security requests in tow, I guess? So I'm I'm actually pretty pleased. Like The culture of ISAT has been, I think, pretty great about this, but we did have to quote unquote grease some palms in the form of like, I wrote a lot of this stuff myself, right? Like we wrote a ticket, had a hard time getting it prioritized, especially for like inner source stuff for like libraries that people work on sparingly. It was like, we just had to step in and write it. And then just once we had it written, the teams were pretty open to implementing it, right? And, and helping us tune the algorithm and help us find out where we did stuff wrong. And it kind of rolled from there, but we've, we've gotten a lot better about it, but we did need a burst of developers to kind of get it going. Hi, here. Uh, great talk, by the way. This way. Yes. Uh, Sorry. So m- my question was maybe just partially answered by your earlier comment around detections, but how do we prevent an internal crowd strike event with the, a bad change going out, a bad credentials being done as part of the rotation? How how do you see that happening? Practice. Practice makes perfect. So. Like I mentioned these DOS events and stuff, right? We we also had scenarios where we just desynced the secret manager. Like I can think of one where we, we had a network condition where um, we tried to rotate the password and it got lost coming back. So we tried to rotate it again, like we retried, and then the first one came back. So we wrote the first one in, but the request had already gone out to change it again. So the second one just vanished into the ether, right? Um, so there's almost no way to stop that, right? Unless you have a rollback mechanism, like you know, HashiCorp Vault or something lets you like roll back a version. So once you figure out what's going on, you you should have a button to go backwards. If you've already updated your LDAP store, you're stuck. You just need to redeploy. So you kind of fall back to basic DevOps principles of, I need to be able to redeploy really fast. I should be able to do reboots really fast. If I'm not gonna do a, a full redeploy, your detection should catch this stuff. And the app teams, you know, if you're not warning them, they should be coming to you, right? We shouldn't be waiting for a customer to tell us something is broken. The app team in the middle, the sec DevOps team, if you will, should also catch that and come let us know, hey, critical problem, what did you do recently? We actually built uh, dashboards because to a certain extent, a lot of the automation, like our rotator, like my team runs that on behalf of other teams and we don't always 
watch it necessarily because it just works. But we built dashboards for all of the teams that just post the data. Here's all the credential stuff that we've done for you recently. And we kind of train them. If they see a problem they suspect is credential related, first thing they go to is that dashboard. And if they see that something happened recently, they call us immediately and say, hey, help, <laughs> right? So. How often, how often do you uh, verify that the app asking for something from the secrets manager knows the old secret? In other words, I want a new secret. I proved to you that I'm a legitimate app by giving you the old secret. Mm -hmm. Do you guys find that necessary? No. So in general, the connection to the secret manager is a totally separate credential from the credential that is being consumed by the app, right? So we do monitor that. Like, aside from the secrets that are in... Uh, like in, in our case, we use a lot of Vault, right? So aside from the secrets that we have in Vault that are being consumed, we also watch Vault for weird events of uh, apps that are not authenticating to Vault properly or constantly failing to log into Vault or trying to read paths that don't exist, right? Or, or reading a path over and over again when they probably don't have a reason to. We have stuff to flag all of that and, you know, again, poke the DevOps team and say, hey, what gives? Like, are you doing this on purpose? Do we have a broken deployment, right? You know. Thankfully, almost all of this has been constrained to like non-prod environments for us. The, by the time stuff got to prod, it's actually been pretty well behaved, which has been very good. Fingers crossed. Uh, so, hi. Yes. Um, I'm a DevOps engineer, uh, regularly hanging out on the security side of town. Um, so most of the things that I do with my team is kind of DevOps as a service. Mm -hmm. uh, so how would I win over the hearts and minds of the developers to be able to for lack of a better phrasing, uh, take care of their SH. Um, and just do what they need to do with all of your, uh, that last thing where you're, you've got that plea, the call out mm -hmm. for the developers. How do you win over those hearts and minds? So I'd say the, the kind of, the formula that's worked for us is, um, there's this idea of like the security dragon that like guards the gate and says, I won't let you to prod unless you do X, Y, and Z. You have to use that very occasionally when there's like a very blatant like crypto violation or like critical vulnerability, but for all the kind of squishy stuff in between, right? You got to meet with the developers on their level and say, how can I help? Do you need me to write the code for you? Do you need me to sketch the algorithm? Like, uh, can I help you write the pipeline to help test it? Can I supervise the tests, right? I'll stay on call with you, right? Like when we try this for the first time, right? Work with the constraints that they've got, but also I think push them to be better. It's it's almost more of like a quest for excellence than it is just like meeting the bar. The, the bar would be, you know, maintenance window, I can change my creds and I'm done, right? The excellence is let's build confidence, let's do this at any time and understand how to respond, right? And that last bit, that, that's what really scares people is, hey, my credential changed out from under me, right? I don't know what to do, who do I call, right? how do I recover, right? And, and we've written like pages and pages of docs about either how to get a hold of us, how to handle it yourself, how to interpret the alerts that we're giving you, right? And over time, things things have gotten better because the, not the tribal knowledge, but the, the organizational kind of uh, key, right, builds up about how to handle this stuff and that we should be expecting it, right? And then the excellence kind of, it, it's a snowball effect, I feel. In one of your slides, you said implement a file watch. Mm-hmm. Uh, file wash doesn't really work well in a containerized environment, uh, especially like for some implementations like Spring. Um, so have you, uh, you usually have to pull for mm -hmm. like the file updates and see if the file has changed. Have you gone around it or what's your experience with this? Um, no, the polling. Um, it, in the containerized environment specifically, I've, I've seen a couple of approaches to this. So like we, we have a... Um, uh, like a sidecar model. I'm, I, I could do like probably different stuff on certs if you want to talk about that, but a, a very basic way to do this if you're not interested in like a full-blown framework like cert manager is implement a sidecar that uses a... Um, uh, like a shared memory like mount to pass files between and then just have both sides kind of pull it every once in a while. Um, again, like how you c configure those parameters are up to you, but j I, I, I understand where you're coming from about certain frameworks make this harder, right? And that's where you have to kind of bolt on like custom stuff and it's just, you just got to try to keep the technical debt down as low as you can. Well, maybe, you know, if you have a refactor coming down the line, right, that makes it easier, you know, just make sure that that's at least on the list of requirements when you're thinking about, you know, your next redesign or refactor or, or what. So uh, this is not a question, but a follow up to your question. Um, if you store a certificate as a secret in Kubernetes, uh, uh, the, you can uh, trigger on that event to reload the application. Um, 
That's at least, at least what we, we did. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, certificate management in Kubernetes is a whole ball of wax. Just yeah. make sure you have your uh, authenticator configured correctly for your domains. Um, a last question for Kenton before we uh, go for break. No more questions. One comment. OK, we'll do one comment if that's All OK. Right. Uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, er everyone has a hard time getting the business involved in security. If you can get your board on uh, into the mode of security, then you can ask them to make sure everyone below the CEO has it on their performance review that they do their work securely. And then they will come to the security department and ask for help. That's my suggestion. Microsoft just did that, right? Like C-suite, yeah, C-suite pay is like now tied to security performance because they have too many critical cyber attacks, right? Like everyone <laughs> should be doing that. <laughs> Oh yeah, <laughs> I I have to be honest as well. During your talk here, I, you know, uh, several times it's a thing about time and you know short-lived credentials and stuff. And I just saw some research coming out. I think it was from academic research from I'm not sure. Maybe it was Germany, mm -hmm. but they had been looking in, into GPS and systems using GPS uh, because GPS doesn't only send you your position; it only, also sends time. And they have found out that, well, in most systems using GPS and GPS time, uh, there is a built-in protection for you cannot turn time back. Mm -hmm. But there's no protection against turning time forward. So they have figured out there are quite a few uh, airplanes and the systems on them. They are using GPS, both for position and time. And they also rely on certificates. So they going. said that if you can just stay outside McCarran Airport and do GPS spoofing, you don't have to care about location, just spoof time and put time like one year into the future, there won't be a single plane leaving that airport for quite some time because you have to update firmware by connecting uh, all the systems physically. So uh, have a nice flight back home and thank you, Canton. <laughs>